Well, today we start with a song of the ages because it's from a scripture for the ages. The eternal word of God. Jeremiah 29, 11. Ooh, a lot of people are going, let's do it. Do it, yeah. And for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans of mercy and peace for I know the thoughts I have to you declares the Lord I want you to think on these words yeah I know the plans yeah and for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans of mercy and peace for I know the thoughts I have for you declares the Lord declares Get ready, get ready. I've got plans to prosper you. I'll never harm you. Got plans to give you hope and a future. Plans of peace and life and not of trouble. Well, I am the Lord who watches over you. I love that line. Yeah, well, I am the God who watches over you. I'm going to do all the words. I want you to get your Bible today. We're in the prophetic worship history and journey of Miss Carla and I. I've been loving this series. I love every episode. It is life-giving and life-changing. What we went through, how the Lord led us, so powerful. But Jeremiah 29, 11, a song for the ages because it comes from the Scripture, the eternal Word of God. I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. What? You got plans, Lord? I appreciate it. Just recently, we were looking at 1 John 2. It says, you received an, an anointing from the Holy One, a sacred appointment. And I connected that to Jeremiah 29, 11. I said, wow, I've got plans. Ken. I've got sacred appointments for you to keep on this earth. I went, wow, Lord, okay, let's get some double revelation going. But I know the plans of Jeremiah 29, 11. I've got plans for you. You do, Lord? Yes. I have a sacred appointment for you. Oh, wow. I've got plans and thoughts toward you. I am your God. I am your God. He, he, he said, I've got plans and thoughts for you. I've got sacred appointments for you. You are my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. You're my sons and daughters. You belong to me. It's a prophetic song for you and me today. Can you see? Can you see it in his word? Yeah. You received an unction from my holy son and I've got plans. Let's sing it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of mercy, think about it. Plans of mercy and peace, I know. 
the thoughts I'm having toward you and about you, declares the Lord, declares the Lord, I've got plans to prosper you, I'll never harm you, plans to give you hope. And a future, plans of peace and life, not of trouble. Wow. I am the Lord who watches over you. I am the God watching over, and I am the God who watches Let's just look at this little chorus. What kind of plans do you have, Lord? I got plans to prosper you. And I promise I'll never harm you. Ah, thank you, Lord. I've got plans to give you hope and a future, and I'm doing it right now. <laughs> wow. Plans of peace in life. I never made plans of trouble for you only the devil did that the thief came to kill steal and destroy but I came Jesus declared the father's heart I came to give you life and light most abundantly I've got plans to prosper you I'll never harm you Plans to give you hope and an awesome future. Plans of peace and life, peace and life, not of stormy trouble. And I am the Lord who watches. Come on, get it today in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, I am the lord who watches over you yeah. i am the lord who's watching over all my sheep you're the sheep of my pasture i'm watching over you for i know plans i have for you Declares the Lord. Woo! Plans of mercy and awesome peace. For I know the thoughts I have to you. Yeah. Declares the Lord. Come on, one more time. I got plans to prosper you. I've got plans to prosper you. I'll never harm. My God, thank you, Lord. Plans to give you hope and a future. Plans of peace and life, not of trouble. I am the Lord, I'm watching over you, I'm watching, I promised, I'm doing it now, I am the Lord who watches over you, oh, rest and breathe in the oxygen of heaven, these are the promises and provisions of God. There's anointment on this today, there's anointing flowing right now. Yeah, yeah, nah, 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 nah. And I eat plans of mercy and peace, Kent. Thank you, Lord. And they insert your name, plans, mercy and peace, mercy and peace over you. Your mercy, my mercy and peace. My mercy and peace, yeah. My mercy and peace.
voices are biting over and in your mercy and peace. Oh, mercy and peace is abiding over and in you, says the Lord, my mercy and my peace. And these are the songs of our prophetic worship journey in history. And there's a tiny little song, Huge Impact, written by my friend from years ago, Daniel Brimer. His son, David Brimer, wrote Worthy of It All. The legacy goes on. But he wrote a song called Make Us a House of Prayer. These are on the record albums, the CDs from 1994. The Righteous Cry Out, huh, Carla? And what was the other one? Jeremiah. 2911 we just did when i heard this song again just a simple verse and a chorus but a cry to the lord make us a house of prayer that we might meet you there and on behalf of the nations to a dying generation make us a house of prayer and oh Lord teach us to pray unceasingly night and day and make our intercession for you a mighty weapon oh Lord teach us to pray make us a house of prayer Isaiah 56 7 won't you make us a house of prayer that we might meet we might meet you there lord on behalf of the nations to a dying generation us a house of prayer and oh Lord teach us how to pray unceasingly night and day yeah, yeah. and make our intercession for you mighty what make and make our intercession for you mighty weapon oh lord we got to do it one more time i want you to learn it and sing it it's a song of prayer it's a cry unto holiness and lifestyle of the kingdom of god make us a house we only repeat Isaiah 56, 17. He said, I'm bringing the foreigners and the sons of the foreigners. These are the songs of our prophetic worship journey right here, right now. I actually recorded this in uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 at the National Worship Conference in 1994. Woo, seems like a long time ago. One more time. Our heart, our cry, song of prayer. Make us a house of prayer that we might meet you there on behalf of the nations my God to a dying generation make us a house of prayer oh lord teach 
just to pray on. Unceasingly night and day, yeah, and make our intercession for you a mighty weapon and make our intercession Lord for you a mighty uh, and make our intercession for you a mighty weapon Oh, Lord, teach us. Oh, Lord, teach us. Lord, teach us to pray. Oh, Lord, teach us. Oh, Lord, teach us. Oh Lord, what a song, two of the most powerful songs we did back at the National Worship. Let's start it up, Carla. What do you remember about that? What's on your heart today? Well, I was thinking about leading up to the Frontlines Conference and what I told you in the last segment about the floods that we had here, the terrible floods. Jesus. Uh, they were so bad that satellite images showed uh, it looked like the Great Lakes down here where the confluence of the rivers came together. It was just, it was just incredibly bad. But prior to that, um, uh, Rick Shelton hosted a series of meetings at Life Christian Center with Roddy Howard Brown. And uh, we had gotten a call from our friend Dave Rubishke up in Alaska, <laughs> who told Kent, asked Kent if he ever heard of, of Basil Brown, uh, Howard Brown. And he said, no. <laughs> and he goes, well, he had a series of meetings up here. We had miracles. We had all kinds of stuff <coughs> happening. So when this came up that uh, Rick was hosting Rodney Howard Brown, we went over to to their to the well, conference. Here's the story. We got to do this because yeah, Dave, Dave Rabishki is a worship leader in Anchorage, Alaska. He works for Chugash Electric. This guy with his shirt and stuff on, you don't want to get in a. I mean, if we're in a fight, he is he's he's ripped. I mean, for his age at that, he he gets ready for a doll mountain sheep hunting, <laughs> running up the mountain out the back of his backyard. <laughs> but Dave called me, and I've known him a long time, Rabishki, um, and he says, Kent, now listen, I'm going to tell you about this guy, Rodney Howard Brown, South African man, came to America. God told him to go to Alaska first and then the lower 48. He's been here, and I've been catching people as they're falling under the power. Look at me. Yes, I do believe in that. People fight over the stupidest things. Are you kidding? If you hook up to 220, you're going down electric. Any electric will tell you. So, you know, it, Dave is doing his part. He's, he's Rodney Howard Brown's catcher, meaning people falling. He's catching them, laying them down on the floor. And then after two weeks of this, and he goes six days a week, 10 and 7, 10 and 7. He takes Sunday off. So two weeks into it, he looks at Dave Rubishki, and we call it a courtesy drop, a CD. You know, people go forward for prayer, and they kind of like fall over, but it's on their own. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's wrong. You know, don't do that. But he looks at, at uh, Rodney Howard Brown, looks at Dave Rubishki, and goes, Dave, you know, I really haven't prayed for you. And he goes, well, I'm not falling under the power. <laughs> he says, I'm no. not falling down. He didn't yeah, I'm not falling power. down. And, and, you know, here, here's Dave. I mean, you can't wrestle this guy. He, he climbed, climbing telephone poles and he's, you know, crazy. He's a great guy. He loves Jesus, spirit filled. And Rodney reached out and touched him and bud, he went down for two hours. He's laying on the floor at Anchorage Christian Center. He said he was stuck to the floor. <laughs> and he says, whatever you do, Ken, if Rodney Har Brown comes in your area, go see him. It's for real. That's all you need to hear from Dave. 
And so when I went down to the meetings and Carla will share about it, first of all, I'm a revivalist. That's what they call Rodney Howard Brown. And some people don't like him. Well, that's on you. But somebody that came to America to bless our nation, a South African prophetic man that came and loves the depths of his presence and loves miracles. I'm I'm all about it. And uh, so anyway, he came to St. Louis. So we started going to the meetings. Go ahead. Well, prior to his coming to St. Louis, though, I told you we had made a decision that we were going to throw our, our whole life's existence up in the air and see where God <laughs> had us land. And uh, we wound up uh, starting to go to church at St. Louis Family Church with Jeff Perry. And this was right before the floods, uh, before it flooded the whole valley. And uh, it's, so Kent gets a call one day uh, to from Jeff, I think. I think it might have been Jeff. And he says, hey, I'm going down to this meeting down in Lakeland, Florida. I want you to come along with me. There's this evangelist down there. We're going to check him out. <laughs> and so Jeff and Kent and Rick Shelton and uh, Jack Harris, right? Mike, Shel- Mike uh, Shepard. Mike Shepard. I, I, I don't know if Jack was there or not, but anyway, a bunch of us went down. Yeah, a, a couple guys got on a plane and went down there and uh, to check it out. Actually, they were going down on their own, and we happened to show up at the same time. Jeff and I were going separate, okay. and they were there, and because Rodney called the whole St. Louis group out to go to lunch with him. Well, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So so uh, they all went forward for prayer, and when they all went forward for prayer, of course, Kent does his usual thing. He runs up on the stage to pray for the worship leader. I was already praying for him when he called. The reason I missed it, I was already up there. The Lord said, give this worship leader, leading for Rodney, the word of, the, give him my word. And so I did. He was just So he did. So when he came back down off the stage, there, uh, Rodney had... <laughs> was praying for these guys and Kent wanted to jump in the line and the usher tried to stop him and <laughs> he says, no, I'm with these guys. And so they, he wound up praying for them. They all went down there laying on the floor. And after Rodney had prayed for everybody, he comes back and he goes, you guys down there, we're going to go to lunch. Well, no, he says, where are you from? Yeah. And uh, Rick goes, St. Louis. And, you know, Jeff's there. I think there were seven or eight of us. And he goes, well, what do you guys do there? He goes, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> He goes, I want to come to St. Louis and to see the power of God move and stuff. And so he said, let's go to lunch tomorrow. Yeah. And th- the story, it goes with this, Jeff and I are fasting. We thought this was so important. So he takes us to the Tampa Bay area. We're in Tampa, right, at this meeting at this large church. And we're seafood like galore. I mean, the unbelievable seafood we're not eating. So and it, it looked wonderful. But anyway, so we go to lunch the next day. You want to pick it up there? You want me to? So he's going around the table asking, you know, uh, asking people who they are. And well, here's the setup. First of all, I'm sitting at the very end of a long table. It wasn't a Red Lobster, but it was an upper level uh, restaurant. Seafood and restaurant. Rick's yeah. down there, Mike, Mike Shepard, um, you know, some other guys, and then Jeff and I are at the end of the table. So he's going around and he's asking, you know, who they are. And so Rick's telling him, well, I pastor a church in, in St. Louis. And, you know, Rodney was asking him a little bit about that. And he, Mike Shepard was with him. And, and, of course, then he gets to Jeff Perry. And Jeff says, I pastor a church in St. Louis. He goes, I want to come to St. Louis, you know. So then he gets to Kent. And, and he said, and Kent says, oh, I'm Ken Henry. No, he says, what's, what's your name? Yeah. And I said, Ken Henry. And everything stopped. I, I was at the, going, okay, here we go. Ronnie goes, are you the Ken Henry? <laughs> I said, there's only one. My wife said the world could only handle one. Maybe the Lord said that as well. He goes, wow. Uh, I said, you know, he kind of stopped. He goes, the worship leader. I said, yeah, I've been doing it a long time. And the whole conversation, I'm way at the end of the table. It was kind of extraordinary because I've always wanted to ask Rodney Howard Brown, how do you preach twice a day uh, and have two, three hour long meetings, two and a half hour long meetings at 10 in the morning, seven at night and never lose your voice? Think about this, you guys. I mean, it's a practical question. He goes, oh, I never shout. He has this kind of deep voice anyway. And I said, I get it. He says, really I don't. Heavy back then too. He, he goes, yeah. I love to shout, but I don't allow myself because it hurts your voice. And every vocal major knows that. I mean, you start shouting big time, your vocal cords, it's really hard in your vocal cords. And so, but then we got this whole conversation about the presence of the Lord. And, you know, we're kind of sitting there. The other guys had ordered, I think. And so you're waiting for the food anyway. But um, it got a little embarrassing. I said, uh, well, he goes, 
I, I tell you, I don't pray as much as people think I do, but I worship all the time. So it was an incredible conversation with this genuine man of God. And I said, well, you might want to talk to the other guys now since we're hogging the whole conversation. But it was very profound in that moment. So he came up to Life Christian Center and did it. I think yes. I think he came up for like six weeks yeah, it was a long in time. a row. And, and I and remember so distinctively, Ariel was still at Westminster. Uh, Jessica was still at Westminster uh, because she got very touched by it. She and another girl mm -hmm. who went to Westminster. Now, Westminster Christian Academy here in St. Louis <laughs> is Presbyterian. Very, very, very Presbyterian. <laughs> Wonderful Christian people, but it was very doctrinal and... So Jessica and this other girl would just see each other in the hall and break out into holy laughter. And, you know, it was just kind of beginning to permeate through the school. No, I tell you why that was important, Carla. Times. The reason it was important, she's at a science lab after hours with her science teacher, four or five other kids in the room. They start debating her on why you really can't be spirit filled now and why the Lord's not speaking to his people is what the Bible is for. And they had, she took this teacher on and debated him up to the wall on why God is still moving in signs and wonders. She told me <laughs> the whole story. And I go, well, at a college preparatory high school that doesn't believe in being spirit-filled as we think of it. <laughs> so that power that was touching her was for real because she would have, well, she would have debated anybody anywhere, <laughs> anytime. But it was really profound what happened with the, the science teacher and the two boys in there because they respected Jessica. They knew her. And she's already, I think she's playing volleyball there, wasn't she? She was playing yeah, volleyball. Yeah, she was a high-level uh, athlete. But anyway, but that, that was the, that's because the, she was current with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we were still living in Crestwood at the time, making plans to move during the summer sometime out to the Chesterfield area Ooh. because we needed to we needed to do, to do that in order for the kids to switch school. And so in the meantime, when the flood came, it flooded St. Louis Family Church. So that now the valley is all flooded and has to all be rebuilt. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah. part of that, the Lord had spoken to Jeff uh, Perry prior to the floods. And said that he he didn't want him to mobilize the church before the floods because God had something for him to do after, and so after the floods happened, he mobilized the church and they virtually cleaned up the valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much so that uh, Jeff, who had been kind of a his name was kind of scourged with the city of Chesterfield, you know, because he's down in an industrial area trying to build a church and they're trying to keep him out. So his church winds up, you know, kind of restoring the whole valley, and he's voted man of the year by the city of Chesterfield and that year. Let's, let's say why. You guys listen to this. This is an incredible testimony. Uh, what was Jeff's dad's name? He's a special guy. Um, um, he's a very, very, he's just kind of a slim guy. Yeah, no, I don't but remember God his gave first him name. a dream. Yeah. And in the dream, the Lord pinned the administrative way to clean up the valley. When he shared it with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they freaked out and said, what you have here is better than what we're doing. Absolutely. And we're going to, I got chills again. So Clyde? Clyde, yeah. Clyde or, Perry. Yeah. I think it was Clyde Perry, Jeff Perry's dad. And Jeff Perry was a great friend of ours. It actually became a template for FEMA. Yeah, so to, for disaster relief, think it was about like what a, we're it was saying. like a computer program. It was a whole system of approach to uh, to disaster relief, and they've implemented it around the world now. And, and, and people go, well, what does that have to do with your prophetic worship journey? That's how the Holy Spirit was operating, because people were sold out to the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I will never forget it, because he, he was a very unassuming man. He was soft spoken. And I mean, he wouldn't go into a room and blow it up and be the life of the party, but he got, had this dream. He pinned it out and he, through the next couple of weeks when the FEMA people, so that's a kind we want to depend on the Holy Spirit to actually in, invade our culture as well. And these guys should have known exactly what they're doing, but his yeah. system from God in a dream was better. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. It Woo. was actually the foundation of Service International, which you know, family church does all over the world. They go to disaster relief wherever there's a disaster. Mm -hmm. They get, they're the first ones called in and they have gone all over the world. I know they were the first ones called into the Northridge uh, 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 earthquake in San Francisco back then. But anyway, we, um, 
where was I going with it? Well, we're moving. We're trying to get set oh, yeah, up. The Rodney kids Hard going Brown. to school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so here we, we, you know, we have this uh, revival. This horrible flood comes, and you know, God is at work through all of this. We have our conference there that year at Life Christian Center, and it was the Frontlines Conference, mm. and uh, we had to turn people away. But, but so coming up the following year. We invited uh, Rick to be one of our main speakers, and we were going to hold a conference at a hotel instead because uh, because we had we weren't at Family Church or we weren't at uh, Victory anymore, and um, I think Janet, you know, talked to Kent about we need to do this, you know, do it. Let's do it in a hotel. So we went ahead and booked that uh, Regency Hotel up near the airport, and it's a. Uh, the, re- the Renaissance. Renaissance yeah. it, it's that black concave hotel. If you ever fly into St. Louis, you see it kind of at the end of the runway out there. And so we had that year, our guest speakers were Rick Shelton and Dick, uh, Dick Rubin. Rubin. And uh, Dick was going to come in and he was going to teach on the breastplate and, you know, tabernacle worship. <laughs> and he had the incense going and, man, he was blowing it up. It was just, it was incredible. It was a big kind of semicircled uh, uh, hall and then around the outside of it you know was was the hallway that where you do all the entrances and so and we had to tell the staff we're burning incense yes. so they wouldn't call the fire department right. or set off alarms and stuff right and uh dick room was known for this he had a trailer on his car had all the articles of the tabernacle in it and he would set it up to show american believers what it was really like right so we had that, and and, and uh, Dick did that in the morning. And so for the the afternoon session, then Rick Shelton got up, and he's he's still in revival mode, you know. So he's talking about about the things that he learned from the Rodney Hart Brown con- conferences, and he sets everybody up. We're going to pray for everybody. I mean, they were lined up in in rows, and and uh, by the time Rick finished, there wasn't one single person standing on their feet, not one anywhere. They were all all on the floor in the building, all around the hallways, you know, everything and again, was... And the staff showed up and says, is everything okay here? Because they were going to call ambulances. <laughs> they were going to call, you know, the EMTs. I said, no, 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 we're, we're good, the ushers told them, because it was prayer, yeah. Right. And so the, the, the and thing was that Dick was so came prevalent. Up and had yeah, a look. Dick Rubin comes he marching had a up bad to Kent. Face. Mm. If anybody knows Dick Rubin, he's a big Ooh. guy. He's, and he's six five. Very intense. He's the tallest Jewish man I've ever met. And so <laughs> he comes up to Kent, and he's got issues with oh, what's with going what on. With what Rick and people falling and, over the power. And Kent says to him, "Now, Dick, I don't want you to say anything because you're do under it. the anointing right now. I don't, don't want you do to it. curse something when you're under the anointing." <sighs> I want you to pray about it. I right. really want you to seek the Lord about what you're seeing here and what you think about it. The reason why this is very, very important is something that was revealed to me years later about a template and a pattern that God uses. And it, it, when He gets, it's kind of like this: when God gets ready to do something major on the face of the earth, like He's going to start a movement or He's going to do something, pour out His Spirit in some way or another. He, in order to, to make it legitimate in the courts of heaven and, in, and before the whole demonic kingdom, he needs to use a Jew. He needs to use person, one of his, yeah. his people. And a, a Gentile. Hebrew, a, yeah. If he's going to do it through Gentiles, he has to do this uh, and combine this messianic Jewish person with a Gentile situation. And years later, when I saw this pattern, I hearkened it all the way back to Kansas City to Mike's testimony about uh, when Bob Jones had come to him, prophesied what was going to happen, and Bob said to him that you would receive me when the snow flies in April. And they had brought in Art Katz, and and he brought it. He came on a private plane. This and is if now you listen in Kansas to the test, City. Not yeah, this is the Kansas City, City testimony City. back in the er, in yeah. the eighties. And uh, he said, um, so they got. Th- th- there was a snowstorm. He actually landed in a blizzard. He barely got in, and they couldn't get out of the airport. So they're holed up now in a an airplane hangar, which is which is uh, an art like a like yeah. a bow. God says he's going to use, when he shoots something, the, the bow and the arrow is the template. 
So here you have that. You've got Art Katz and Mike Bickle and Bob Jones and all these prophetic. And you go, what did God shoot out of that bow and arrow at that particular time? It was the whole prophetic movement, the, the, the restoration of the, of the prophet and the, the office of the prophet. I mean, that was the whole beginning of the prophetic thing. So now fast forward to 94, we're in this, in, in this bow-shaped yeah. hotel. hotel. <clears throat> and uh, Dick, when he was finished with our conference, he was scheduled to go down to Brownsville to the Assemblies of God down in Brownsville, uh, Florida with... Uh, uh, Fitz, Fitz, what, are, what were the guy's names? Um, I'm, I'm not recalling right now. The, Hill, the, the last name was Hill. Steve Hill. Steve Hill. And John, John Kilpatrick. John Kilpatrick, yeah. So they had him come down because they wanted him to teach on the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Yeah, so I told Dick before he left, and we didn't know he'd end up at Brownsville in the revival there, but I said, Dick, don't contempt, condemn something because you've not seen it before. Don't burn it. Don't... Don't call it fake and, you know, not of the Holy Spirit. And thank God he told us later that he didn't. Yeah, so he yeah. goes down to, to First Assembly in Brownsville and is teaching on the restoration of the Tabernacle of David. And they're doing the whole processional and everything. And God just comes in with his presence. <laughs> And, and guess what uh, starts happening? Yeah, People start getting prayed for and they're falling on the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it goes on so for a year, he year goes and goes down, yeah. And it, it sets the whole stage for the Brownsville revival. Yes. And if you and, and if you know anything about <laughs> prophetic things that happened, when Yonggi Cho, who was a pastor in North Korea in South Korea, came over here to America, he prophesied revival in America. And he said, this is what revival in America will look like. It's going to begin in the seaside town of Pensacola, Florida. And from there, it will jump to the Mississippi River. And from there, it will engulf the nation. So what was shot out of that conference that year by putting Dick Rubin and Rick Shelton together and Kent Henry, two Gentiles and a Jew, what was shot out of that bow and arrow? Revival in America, the beginnings well, of it. Well, it's anyway. called the One New Man. Yeah. When, in, when Kurt Landry, and you might get to this when you're, you're I'll get to get it to later it. on down the but, line. But I'm just saying that he said it's one new man, the Jew and the Gentile, uh, alive in Christ together. And that's why when Dick went down there, if he, I'm, I'm certain of this, if Dick would have uh, condemned that and really showed his butt in a really bad way, I doubt it would have happened because, by the way, they documented this, that Dick's teaching not just on the Tabernacle of David, but on communion is what brought the power of God to Brownsville it happening. And by the way, while we're on this, I, I don't want to leave Rodney Howard Brown. My experience is that um, I, I share this very, not very often. I have no reason to, but when I'm finished leading worship uh, for an hour, hour and a half, I've had people come up and hug me and start to fall down under the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've had children, teenagers, because I'm flowing in a certain level of the anointing, I ask Rodney Howard Brown, how do you not go down? He says, oh, there's a realm of glory. If I go too far, I will, I will go out because the realm of his glory is uh, just so powerful. I say that because I was in the meeting and, and I'm used to kind of being in the glory, whatever that means, as a worship leader. <clears throat> and I remember distinctly, and I felt I should share this so I don't want to miss it before we go on. I'm in a meeting with Rodney Howard Brown. Um, uh, the worship was, was pretty good. It was pretty good, okay to pretty good, a uh, long offering. But then when he started praying, I realized I felt like I was going to sleep. The power of God, I was sitting in a pew at Life Christian Center. I'll never forget this. One of the first times this ever happened to me. And I finally slid out of my seat and I was on the floor. I did not know. It was a power of God transformatively happening in me. I felt like I had gone to sleep. And when I woke up, I don't know, it was 15 or 20 minutes later, I went, wow. So the power of God is real. It, it's it's for sign and wonders and miracles because some people blown it off now they oh the book of acts will never happen again be careful 
I'm warning you. It's a caution, a high level caution. The Lord, the, the Lord doesn't need our permission to do anything, and He can do it because we're His creation. But I want to make sure I shared that, hun, that I've had the power of God hit me while I'm leading worship. And there's a couple times I said, I'm going off this piano bench. I'm not standing up here. Hope somebody else can lead worship. He's uh, Piper down. <laughs> in the Because I, I, that glory and the power is real. So go ahead and pick it up, hun, from there. Well, uh, so much so that uh, this happened not, not long after that. Uh, Ken had arranged to go down. He, he had actually gone to Israel with this group of people from Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, from the father's house, David and Crystal Travis. And the, he went with them and Dick Rubin. And this is where <laughs> Dick actually gave Kent that ring that he wears, you know, that's you yeah. might want to share that with him. You were on the Sea of Galilee, and you were leading worship. Well, for, first of all, Dick, it was like uh, a big uncle to me. I mean, he he's somewhat old. He just passed away a couple of years ago, and I miss him. He, yeah. He's a great man of God uh, from the tribe of Reuben. That goes all the way back. And uh, I would mess with Dick because he was kind of cross. He was a little, he wasn't like a super happy he was guy. pretty stodgy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I would mess with him. I mean, I'm 6'2", 200 pounds, but he was 6'5". Again, I've never met a Jewish man, Jewish person that tall. And so he got used to it. He liked me. He, I said, you're going to have to hug me now because that was really good. And he, he loves the presence. He says, Kent, you are something else. When you start leading worship, all heaven is breaking loose. And he had different things to share with me. But we went to Israel together. The, the, the family, the pastoral couple and the church had asked me to go to Israel. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee at Dollywood. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, what Knoxville? It's down. It's uh, it was Pigeon Forge. Pigeon Forge. Sorry, is that because I had to fly into Knoxville, Tennessee at the flight? And so we're at one of these large restaurants that seat like a hundred people. It's in the afternoon, and I meet David Travis because I'd prayed for Crystal, his wife, and she said, "Would you come to our church? We're probably not big enough." And they were father's house was four or five hundred people, yeah, and I said, "I'll be church. there." And so we're at a restaurant. David goes, it's good to meet you. We're chatting it up. He goes, by the way, I want to invite you to go to Israel with us. I said, oh, no, I, I'm not going. He goes, what? I said, uh, bro, let me tell you, when I go to Israel the first time, I'm going to lay in the dirt. I'm just going to get off the bus. Now, I'll lead worship. I go, you guys going to lay in the dirt? He goes, well, we can. <laughs> And then he says, well, you know, we're going to do this, this, and the other. It's a tour. It's a tour and all that kind of stuff for 10 days. I get it. And I said, yeah, it doesn't, you know, like 60 people on a tour bus. I I don't know. It's going to be real. We got, you know, how is Holy Spirit going to be on this? And then uh, he says, we're going to pay your way. It'd be like $3,000. I said, yeah, I don't really care. It's got to have teeth. It's got to be so stout. I don't, I want my, I just want to whack me. He goes, Dick Rubin's going and he's teaching every day, twice a day. I said, I'm I'm, in, in, bro. I'm coming. (laughs) Because if you let me lead worship in front of him twice a day, we're going to have a great time. And that's what exactly happened. Matter of fact, it was, <clears throat> was that the tour? They had two tour buses. I had to go back and forth. I led worship all over the land in Israel. Again, a part of our prophetic worship history. I even I, I knew a bunch of, uh, you know, like Jewish messianic bass songs anyway. And so check this out, you guys. All the guitar players will love this. <laughs> I have the driver's mic in front. Somebody would hold that as the microphone holder, and I plug my guitar into. There were only two inputs, and we sang all over Israel. I'd go back and forth between the buses. It was huge, and Dick Rubin blew it up teaching-wise. It was so powerful. Anyway, there yeah. it is. So, oh, oh uh, my ring. And yeah. he, here it is. If you can, I don't, I, we can't really get a close-up. But people have asked me. I've never really taken it off once he gave it to me. He gave it to me on the Sea of Galilee. After you had it resized to fit your middle yeah, finger. I had to, <laughs> because his hands were so big, mine are medium size. And I said, Dick, must be a really important ring. He got it made, custom made by a, a Jewish uh, jewelry, jewelry shop mm-hmm. in Jerusalem. And when he was on one of his trips, it's in Hebrew. And I said, what does it say? He goes, the Lord the shepherd, no want. And I said, say it again. He goes, well, the Lord, the shepherd, no want. I said, is there a problem with that, Dick? There's no verb in the statement, in the the ring then. He goes, Kent, Yahweh is the verb. The great I am 
If he says it, he's the verb. I said, I get it. Okay, I won't ask again. So I've got the Lord, the shepherd, no want, and it's a verb action word. I've been wearing it uh, for how many years? Not a long time. So it wasn't long after that that Ken had arranged to produce an album for Crystal. She had written some songs and had a really good voice. So we went down to to Father's house to do this conference. And uh, mm. I remember Jackie Lusk, she came over from Nashville. Nashville. She was there and uh, Pam Stock was there and different people. And it was so powerful that, you know, after Kent led worship, he just kind of went over and, and laid on the floor behind the speakers. <laughs> and Dick gets up there and he goes, he goes, where's Kent? Where's Kent? And he's looking around and he sees him laying on the floor, you know, behind the speakers. He goes, get on up here, Kent. We're going to have a healing service. God's anointing us all over you. Well, he couldn't get off the floor. Kent yeah. couldn't get off the floor. So he got, so Dick gets two ushers to get him up and hold him up. He said, now hold him up. And they did like Moses, you know, they held him up and held his hands. And then people came up and they'd flop his hand over on their head. And everybody would do. Well, we were praying for worship and... leaders as well. That was the point. It was a healing line. But he also called out the worship leaders, which they had, uh, you know, advertised the conference as worship and the word with right. Ken Henry and Dick Rubin and stuff. Uh, and I'll never forget it because you kind of, I was like in La La Land and the glory. But it You was, talked about uh, being in, in like powerful. a cloud. Yeah. You know, after that. So the, mm -hmm. that was really a powerful time. We missed Dick. Hi, Deanne. That's his wife. Deanne. <laughs> she better Deanna. be watching. I Deanna. love you, Dan. Anyway, um, so um, so anyway, that that all was happening, you know, around the time that we did this conference. And, uh, you know, and the whole thing being shot out, Revival in America, you know, and but that year, that particular year, we did it, the conference at the hotel, but we did the night of worship at life. So we had to bus everybody. We had to rent buses to bus everybody who didn't have a car, who flew in, you know. The nice thing was it was right there by the airport, so people didn't have to rent cars. They could just shuttle mm -hmm. over to there. But we had to bus everybody down to Life Christian Center where we did the night of worship. Deborah and Jules had come up that year, and they decided that they were going to take an offering for Kent and I personally. So it kind of it kind of elongated the the the, the service. service, you know, because they had we had taken a break, or during the time of the break, then these people came up and they were they were giving us stuff. So it ran kind of late, but I remember doing the uh, the song where they picked up all the flags and they were. They were uh, dancing around the sanctuary all with nations. all the flags of the nations. All nations. All nations yeah, will come and worship. That was on there. And and we reprised it at the end of, of, of it all. And nobody was leaving. Nobody would leave. They were flashing <laughs> up on the, on the overhead. The buses are leaving now. <laughs> the buses are leaving right now. And a couple hundred people got stuck there overnight. Wow. And but, call and cabs. You might go, why did you do that? Because see, the conference during the day could not house the right. evening session. It was right. too big. It was a couple, 3,000 people. Uh, we probably had at least, I don't know, it was 1,500 or 1,400 at the, the hotel. That was the biggest place in St. Louis County we could find and stuff. Yeah. But I think that was the energy, the presence of God, people's hunger for the Lord. That's 93 or 94 now. You're talking about 94. 94. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, that was 94 when we had Dick Rubin, Rick yeah. Shelton. We recorded Make Us a House of Prayer. I mean, what was the theme of this? Jeremiah 29, 11, and I then the, the whole thing. the that I have for you. Yes, and right. then Make Us a House of Prayer with a whole prayer movement, you know, intermingled praise with prayer was really beginning to gain momentum. Well, I think it's important, hon. I don't want to run out of time in this stream. I want you to finish Kurt Landry. It's the bronze bow being pulled back by and the hand of the Lord. That's another prophetic okay, I, thing I, later I just on. want to yeah. make sure. That was from Zechariah yeah. 9, 11 through 13. So there are movements on the earth, a point being where God starts using a Jewish person, a Jewish man of God, or somebody in a Gentile as one new man. And we got clued into that, that the release of the Lord, there's power on it. It doesn't happen all the time or every year necessarily. Well, that was something that Kurt shared with us years later. Right. And this will be later on down the line in the testimony because it's very prophetic. But he was in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, and he was... Uh, um, 
He was there on the very day that Kent and Jim were in the prayer room in Kansas City, the very December 6th. And uh, he was having this experience when they were dedicating this prayer stadium that Dr. Nico had, had built in Jakarta, Indonesia. And he had this experience where he was, he in, in the vision, he was like bent over backwards, like in a back bend, and this light was shooting up out of him. And that's when God gave him the revelation of Zechariah 11 through 13. Which this is, will have to do with the 9-11 prophecies as we get right. down the line. But what does Zechariah say? But, yeah. So Zechariah says he was going to bend Ephraim and oh, shoot, you right, know, Ephraim. shoot him at the Greeks. Right. Anyway, there's there's a whole message in that, a whole 9/11 message in that, and yeah. and a prophetic thing that we'll get into later on it has to do with Jim and. Well, I just things. want to collect our thoughts for a second, hun. Uh, I want to go back so people understand the National Worship Conference was super powerful, even for us that knew his presence and. Again, a friend of mine had called and said, hey, listen, I'm kicking this thing up in Dallas, and maybe you can come down, and we're going to do a bunch of uh, breakout classes. And I said, bro, why are you doing that? I, I think it's more important. You know, people come to a worship conference, they actually worship. When I hung up the phone, I said, man, that, I would never do a, worship, a national worship conference. And that's where the Lord said, oh, no, you're going to do one, but it's based on two things. Now, think about this in your life. Your Sunday morning worship service, your Bible study. He said, I want you to let people at my worship conference that you're leading, <laughs> proper, my worship conference that you're leading, I want you to let them meet with me and linger and release the times of refreshing because they're tired and they're worn out. So Acts 3.19 has become a life scripture, a lifestyle scripture for me. Acts 3.19, why don't you repent and be converted? Okay, Lord, we did that. And why would we do that? Well, number two, Acts 3.19, so your sins would be blotted out. <sighs> and I've used this all throughout my worship uh, flow and history and all that being the name of this you know, episode. And then he says, so that, so that after you repent and your sins are blotted out, the times of refreshing, let's just stop will come from my presence. What are you going to do, Lord? Well, I'm going to have my times of refreshing and their soul and spirit come to them. One of the highest things that people told us about the National Worship Conference, again, we were meeting with the Lord, lingering in his presence, number one, and then release the times of refreshing. So we'd have prayer, uh, corporate prayer in the congregation. We'd have people come forward for prayer. But he says, let my times of refreshing from my presence rain pour over them. I want you to think about it for a minute, and you need to look it up if you don't know Acts 3.19. It, it is a paramount zenith scripture uh, about lifestyle worship, about living in his presence. He said, I have times of refreshing if you want them. Uh, Carla and I have watched through the years, sadly, disappointingly, pastor after pastor burn out, Elders fall in sin, associate pastors leave the ministry. I can tell you this, they did not know Acts 3.19 and were not living in the power of it. The times of refreshing that come from his presence, what a way to end this stream. On, <laughs> I mean, I, would, I didn't know I'd get on this right now, but I'm telling you, the times of refreshing has the repair of the breach in it, it has the rescue of the Lord in it. Matter of fact, I haven't taught this for years. It's coming up right here, right now. You can go in his presence, into his presence, and the times of refreshing will be so powerful, it will renew your soul and fix anything that's wrong in your spirit, man. So make sure you write it down. Uh, I'm very proud in the Lord of what happened at the National Worship Conference, his worship conference that he kind of let us uh, help governorship over it, that we met with the Lord, and that's where people were touched and changed. Always his person and presence will do that. We met with the Lord, and then times of refreshing. So write it down, make it plain, uh, print it out on your printer, your computer, put it on your refrigerator, put it in your car, let live and let the times of refreshing flow from his presence. And you're going to be all right. You're going to do really good in this life. 
And because people ask, Kent, there's no way. How do you maintain your passion and fire? And has the light ever gone? Well, the light and the fire has never gone out. It could be at a low ebb, but it's because I'm a worshiper. And it's, it's spoken of all the way through the book of Psalms and in the New Testament. If you worship the Father in spirit and truth, you're going to be lifted to another level. Carla, I want you to finish it out. Give us your final, your thoughts here on this as we close out. Well, oh, I'll leave it God. with this. Uh, wow. There's precedence, and God sets precedence in his word. First mention is one of them. And there was a man by the name of Jubal in the book of Genesis. And Jubal is known for, he was the creator of instruments of music. And Jubal's name, well, actually it's where we get the, the word jubilee, jubilate, jubilation. Jubal's name literally means to create a water course. So basically what music does, it just creates a flow for the Holy Spirit to come and ride on. So just establish this flow with your music and let the Holy Spirit take it where he wants to go. It's a water course. And it's in the water flows from underneath the throne of God. And it flows wherever it goes. And wherever it goes, it brings healing and peace and justice and righteousness and every other ness you can think of that belongs to God. All nations will come and worship. It's in the scripture. Will come and we're, they were flagging for an hour. <laughs> they and got they missed stuck the there. bus. The oh, buses are leaving. <laughs> they were so caught up. They'll come and worship. Shall come and worship you. For you are great and mighty, Lord. You are God alone. You gather the nations together to worship at your throne. They're all coming in the nations here. We'll come and worship. We'll come and worship you, Lord. All nations shall come and worship. Shall come and worship. Do it again, all nations. Yeah. And all nations. Yeah shall come and worship my God shall come and worship you Lord all nations shall come and worship Lord shall come and worship for you're great and mighty yeah for you are great Think of what's coming, my God. And all nations shall come and worship. Shall come and worship you, Lord. And they all nations shall come and worship. What a day, what a stream, what an episode for his glory. Our prophetic worship journey our prophetic worship history. Praise be to God. Thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy to do these things for your glory, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Well, we appreciate your lives. Remember Acts 3, 319, the times of refreshing that come from his presence. We'll see you real soon. Shalom, shalom. God bless.